right. That's what I thought. Facebook is giving us a hard time again. Come here. We're live on YouTube. Copy this. Paste there. Hey everybody, we're just trying to get everything set up on Facebook today. save it looks like we're live on Facebook excellent well we will make do today <laughs> today's gonna be a technically challenging day a for those bit. of you out there so let's see who's checking in. Uh, let's do a quick check in. We'll give another minute or two for everybody to get in. It's 9.01. We're running a little bit late because of some technical issues today, but we will get started real soon. Yep, uh, we're still waiting for people to check in here. So hopefully the technical difficulties will give it a little bit of time to, to get <laughs> to situated. trickle in. Yes. I'm not sure if we are live on Facebook. There we go, yep. All right, let's leave this page. Here we go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and get started. We are running just a few minutes behind um, from do some technical difficulties, but that is not something you should have to worry about. Let's get out of there. Make sure I don't hear myself talking the whole show. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Welcome to the PoE Texas live stream, Converge PoE. If you're like me and uh, the teleprompter is not working, but if we'll get it started here in just a second, but if you're like me and the rest of the world, you probably had a one, had a problem troubleshooting power over ethernet. Something went wrong in your life, something that didn't work for you, and that is a real problem. And that is the topic of our show today. We are gonna be covering troubleshooting with power over ethernet and um hopefully we we it looks like we've got mark mullins from fluke on the line so he made it <sighs> by the skin <laughs> of his teeth mark a lot of weight off of our wow shoulders. no no pressure here but uh with that why don't we get the show started and let's um let's fire it up All right, I'm Tyler Andrews, head Shifu here at PUE Texas, and all, as always, my lovely co-host, co -host, Miss Maria Medell. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. So today, um, joining us from Seattle, Washington, we have Mark Mullins. Mark Mullins is one of the founders of Fluke Networks, which started in 1993. In his current role as marketing manager, Mark oversees customer collaboration through worldwide channels and engagement strategies. His expertise ranges from sales automation, virtualization and firewall, to channel strategies and development. With a background like this, you know he's going to have some great insight to share with us today. Um, so have your questions ready and join us in welcoming Mark to Converge PoE. Wow, hey, thank you. I, I look I'm a little grainy, but uh, otherwise okay, I think. Yes, well, we're it's glad you made it on. It was, it was a close run thing getting you on the show today. Ooh, yeah, I know. Uh, and the quality may not be so great, but uh, our, our corporate uh, management here decided to uh, make the network as difficult to use as possible. Uh, they don't let me be in charge of it. Uh, although, you know, we've for years, we've uh, we've used our corporate network for testing a lot of our products. And um, we never actually booked anything, but 
I guess they get nervous and think that we're going to go in and do something really bad to the network. But <laughs> right now, it's it's mostly about the cabling, and I, I don't think I've ever broken a network cable here. So aside from that, I'm okay. It looks like I'm chopping the top of my head off here, so let's uh, let's get that going a little bit better. How's that? Much better. Okay. And I take it I sound all right. Yeah, you sound great. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, sorry about all the last minute uh, poop jumping. So how do we how do we want to do this? We want to jump in and maybe uh, have me go through a little bit of my uh, my canned speech. I promise it won't be boring. Yeah, I don't know, so Mark. A little bit of background. <laughs> Mark has sent us a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Learning time. It's <laughs> learning time. So everybody, get out, get out your, uh, get out Take your some notes. Yes, <laughs> we're ready. The, the 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 Mark, as you can tell, Mark. If you pardon me, if I say this, Mark, you do look very professor esque. So for all of us at home, it. it is it, the only thing that maybe would have made it better. Made it better would be a bow tie. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, Mark. If I classic image. Yeah, <laughs> I have one, and I know how to tie it. Um. You know, so, I was just reading, speaking of Professor Esk, about the, I don't know, have you, have you heard about the uh, the big chalk um, shortage? There's a company in Japan yes. that makes super high-end chalk that all the mathematicians love to use. And uh, I don't have any of that, though. So I don't either, but I was watching it. And apparently mathematicians are serious about that chalk. But we're not here to yeah. talk about chalk. Not we're today. here because no. our audience wants to know about PoE. So, Mark, why don't I swap you over and we would love to see this PowerPoint presentation for our audience. Okay. I saw this PowerPoint presentation at Bixie. It is exciting and we promise there will be some excitement and fun. So Mark, let me swap you over. Okay, thank you. All so right. I, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of background about PoE, but I think this audience knows about this. So we'll go through this pretty quickly. But the idea with the latest PoE standard, 802.3 BT, is to give us to give more power, right? So let's just click on that. We got a lot of interaction going on here. So we got, uh, we got Scotty. Where's Scotty? Scotty, we need more power. So um, go ahead and put that next slide up and just animate all the way through it so we can kind of see what's going on. But you know, the original PoE we had 15 watts of power, could handle a lot of stuff. Then we moved up with the PoE plus to 30 watts. And then the BT, by using all four pairs, will give us 60 watts and uh, up to uh, up to 90 watts. This is a slide I got from uh, some of my access communications. They make um, security systems, including uh, including cameras. And one of the things they talk about with you know at the 60 and 90 watt level is being able being able to have very high resolution point tilt and zoom cameras that even have heaters in them so that they can. Uh, in colder areas of the country. Um, we were trying to set up a way to demonstrate that. We were going to take one of their cameras and put it in a freezer, but it, it seemed like we'd be burning up so much energy on all sides that we decided not to. If you look under the 60-watt arrow there, one of the things I think that's interesting that they have on the drawing board is can you see the little car with the arm going up and down in front of it, like in a parking yes. place? Yeah, that's one of the things they've been... They think they could power that off of uh, 60 watts of PoE. So that that would be my one of my favorite things to see is the arm going up and down. I don't know if, uh, Tyler, if you guys are planning to get into that market, but uh, I think that's one of the more interesting ones. The other thing you can do with 90 watts, of course, is you can power a pretty good-sized display. So you think about the displays, say, at the uh, uh, where you go pick up your luggage, where they uh, tell you which uh, which turnstile to go to or which uh, baggage pickup to go to and all the ads for local uh, tourist traps, they'd be able to drive those off of PoE as well. So let's go to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about this. So these terms I think were should be fairly well known to everyone. You've got on one end of the table, you've your power sourcing equipment or your PSE. Whoa, what's going on there? And then hey, on Mark, the other sorry end, about that. Yeah. You're a handsome guy. Thank you. <laughs> I was told I looked like a, I was a taller, better looking version of Yoda. That was a our marketing <laughs> VP told me that. I, I don't know what that meant. I don't know if I should be. Uh, on the other end of the cabling is the powered device. So in, in case here, that's, that's actually one of your high end uh, point tilt and zoom cameras that you've got there. On the, the power source, usually a switch, or in the second diagram, you see it could be a mid-span injector. 
something, you've got a basic switch that doesn't support PoE, you put in a mid-span injector. Uh, Tyler, I'm sure you could tell us all about that. But I love me mid -span. pretty simple. <laughs> mid-span man? Yep, I One love me some mid -span. superheroes. All right, so go to the next slide here. And uh, so with four pair PoE, as I mentioned, you've got these, these different classes, the different power levels. Now, in the standard, it talks about the power level that is delivered by the switch. So in the case of, say, class five, you've got watts at the switch. But because you may lose some power over the course of the cabling, the device at the far end should only expect to get 40 watts of power. Now, it, it may get more, depending on how good your cable is, and we're going to talk about cabling a lot in a few minutes, but, uh, but that's just to allow a little bit of allowance to make sure everything's gonna work. Everything class five and above is obviously four pair power um, and uh, all described by the 802.3 BT standard. So let's move on to the next slide. We'll, bring, we'll come back to that in a minute. I think everybody knows about the advantages, right? Because you can avoid the cost of conduit, wire, uh, some sort of box to put the outlet in, the labor of the electrician. Average cost to provide power to a device is around $1,000, so PoE can save almost all of that cost because the average cost of a PoE drop, which you probably have to put in anyway, is about $250. So there's a big savings there. Now, one thing I noticed that's very interesting, and since we get involved in a lot of standards and also construction requirements, building codes and whatnot that are kind of related to our business, We've seen a push. I think some of the electricians would like to get a bigger share of this business. And now there's some talk about requiring electrical codes to describe any, uh, any power connection that has over, I think it was 40 watts I saw. I think that's, that might actually be going on in Texas. I don't know if, if it, that's something it is, you've heard about. It is going on in Texas, and we're going to be actively participating and opposing it. So we're going to be asking our audience here, uh, to reach out and express to your local senators and Congress people that it is not it is not our wish to block that kind of savings and and make POE harder and it's a weird little uh, add-on bill that the that's been just slapped in there. So we're going to be sending out a newsletter to everybody about this. Okay, make sure I get a copy of that too because that, that's the kind of thing a lot of our you know, a lot of our customers are contractors. Some of them are electrical contractors do both kinds of work. Others are uh, just data contractors and, and do this kind of work. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. In fact, the next slide, I think they mentioned that a little bit. No, sorry, I'm going to talk about something else. That's right. This was something I wanted to mention that uh, not everyone understands, and this is kind of getting more into the cabling side of the business, but one of the things that you have to do when you're thinking about installing cabling for PoE is thinking about derating. Now, this isn't just for PoE, this is for actually all data cabling. And depending on what kind of a cable you're using, you're going to have to derate it. In other words, you have to take away a certain number of meters of length from a typical 100 meter uh, channel run. So you can see there, at the line, show you your unshielded category six, and you can see at 60 degrees centigrade, which is not really uncommon if you get up into the plenum area, the hot parts of a building, or especially if you're running the cabling outside, you can see that you've got to take almost 20 meters cable off of that 100. I mean, that's your maximum length that they will guarantee will work. One of the things that's uh, interested is the foil screen UTP, the KXAF, as we talk about out there, it's only seven meters to degrees. So the foiling, the foil shielding that's more than just protect the data. It also allows you to get away with um, some of the derating, and uh, you can run longer runs with the uh, in the same temperature range. Go to the slide. Hey, Mark, Another thing that people ask us about. Yeah, go ahead. Mark, real quick question on this one that, that I think is an important question. When you say derating and reducing the length, that's more for the data than it is for the power, I'm assuming. The power will keep going. Correct. And what and what we're talking about though is cat 6a cable is really rated for 10 gigabit so uh, right. i think what, what what you're seeing is is you're derating it but let me ask this question when you say derate it does the cable like if i'm only doing 10 100 or i'm only doing gigabit 
does the uh, does that derating affect that, or is it just that top end that you know I I can't do ten gig, I can only do five gig or something like that? You know that's probably true, but I'm going to give an answer that's going to kind of sound like a politician, but because of the way the standards committees work, they are kind of political, right? You've got cabling mm -hmm. guys on one side, and you've got equipment manufacturers, and then you've got test vendors like us. And you know what they'll tell you is, you know what, if you want to meet the standard, this is what you got to do. And we're not going to give you any wiggle room like, well, you know, it'll probably work with maybe if you only run one gig or something like that. In reality, the physics of it, you're probably right. But when it comes right down to it, and if I was a building owner, I'd probably say, no, no, look, I'm paying for 6A. I want the full 6A performance. I don't want this. Yeah, you know, 90% of the time, it'll probably be for one gig. Mm -hmm. So, well, the, the other I, thing that I would do is turn that around as a, as a troubleshooting tip for our audience today, keeping in mind that if you have a 330 foot run or a 100 meter run and, you know, it, you're getting some inconsistency, you're getting bad data or it's slowing down or you're getting high packet loss, this would be an area I'd come back and double check, make sure that they didn't run the cables right over the boiler or through right. a, you know, run it right through the outside under a, an aluminum shielding where the heat would build up and it could derate that cable. Now you may never notice it as Mark is pointing out, but that's an important troubleshooting tip there. Thanks for letting me uh, yeah, I, steer that off a little. And, and one of the things too that, I'd, uh, that, I, that I also worry about when you have situations like that where you kind of play fast and loose with the specs and, you know, I, I've seen people run uh, 500 foot category 5e runs and they actually worked just fine for 10 meg but the problem is is that you know after you leave and the next guy comes in and he tries to upgrade the speed or maybe it gets a little hotter this summer than it's been any other summer and suddenly things stop working you can only imagine how difficult that kind of problem would be to troubleshoot right mm -hmm. because it's going to be kind of an in thing, nobody ever really thought about it. Nobody realized that that run was that long or got that hot. So, you know, it's it's always true that you can kind of play around with the physics of the thing and say, well, you know, really, it's, it, it's pretty good. It's probably going to work. But you are kind of planting a time bomb somebody in the future that after, you know, maybe after you're gone in that building, you know, your successor is going to have a nightmare. He's going to spend three weeks trying to troubleshoot this problem. Now, so, if, you, if, you, if you do run into this problem, Mark, we have a couple of potential solutions later on. But let's let's keep you moving on. We got to keep it yeah. on this slide for a while. And I, <laughs> I, I'm seeing our chat line build up. Some of yeah. our audience is asking questions, and I love hearing from okay. our audience. So, okay, so let me let me jump on the next one. The other thing that, uh, and this one's a pretty easy one to deal with, but with a, with bundling of cabling, you know, people, you've probably seen that. Uh, you've probably heard of the cable porn Reddit. And, uh, you know, we have a Friday cable feature and people put together these magnificently beautiful bundles of cable. They're all color coded and they're pretty and they're, you know, nice, tightly bound together. That's not really the best thing for cabling. It looks good. And in fact, I've talked to a lot of architects that say, yeah, but my customers really want this. The best recommendation is to not bundle your cables. Leave them open in cable trays. And if you do have to bundle, put together smaller bundles of cabling because not only do you have to deal with the, you know, the crosstalk interference between them, but if you're running PoE, the, the heat is going to build up in these things. And I, I, if you go ahead, a, click ahead, there's a table I want to I want to just make sure people see. This is actually out of the TIA spec. Yeah. So one of the things is multiple smaller bundles will do better for heat buildup. And once again, you see a table here, and if you click one more time, once again, it's related to the gauge of your wiring and the temperature that you're uh, expecting to run at and how many cables you put in a bundle. And one of the things is that it's a pretty good rule of thumb. You're almost always safe if you limit your maximum bundle cable size to 24. We could, we could spend an hour on this, and I don't really want to, but I just want to let people know that especially if you're dealing with PoE, the the smaller bundles is a, is a really good way to do it. No bundling at all is great, but even if you do want to bundle, keeping it to 24 will keep you safe in almost any situation. So just wanted to let you know about that. That's great feedback. In our lighting show last week, a lot of people were asking questions about the higher power cables. Mm -hmm. Do they work? What kind of things? And this is great feedback for our audience to know that the 
if you're putting in the 90, 16, 90 watt, consider just not bundling or not bundling above yeah. 24 cables. So I think that's what I'm taking well, or, away from that. Yeah, yeah, and I got a couple of recommendations here. Just throw those up there on the screen. Um, there we go, yeah, wire trays are a great idea so that you get rare flow around it. Reduce the at maximum operating temperature, try and avoid running through hot places. And one other thing is don't put all your powered cables in one bundle and all your unpowered cables in another bundle, right? Not every cable is going to have a lot of power running on it. So if you, when you're designing things, mix them up a little bit and then you're going to be safe. So, you know, following a few of these rule of thumbs will guarantee you're not going to have heat problems. All right, that's all, that's all I wanted and, to say. And let me, let me double check one thing on that, Mark. You're also not going to get disrupted data by mixing powered and unpowered of cables. And, yes, and that's yeah. an important feature because, you know, as, as, a, you know, as an engineer, my, my background in the world industrial, you never mix power and you never mix instrumentation and controls. And in this case, we're saying because of the type of data and the type of power and the cables that they run in, you can mix power and data in the same runs running parallel with PoE. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And in fact, one last thing I talk, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, the higher power PoE, are you really going to want to want to run 10 gig over that? And, you know, I think those people, they have a point, but you never know what the future is going to hold. So if you're going to spend the money to put in good cable, you should get what you pay for. But the other thing that, uh, that the cabling manufacturers like to hold out there is they say, well, what about Li-Fi? I don't know if you've talked about that with your, with your, uh, with your audience before. But that's the idea of running Wi-Fi signals through the LED lighting. So not mm -hmm. only do you have to have enough power to run the LED lighting, but if you want those, you know, to have decent throughput, you're probably going to want to run 10 gig to them, just like you're running 10 gig to your 802.11 AC access points today. And then the new, what is it, the new AX, or what are they calling it, Wi-Fi 6 now? Is that the, the new name for it? So you know, you may well have high power and high data rates on the same cables. Very cool, very cool. All right, I'm gonna hit a couple other points. Um, I might skip over one of these, but um, one quick one, uh, I think the modular plug terminated link is first. Yep, okay, let me talk about that just briefly. So people kind of understand what's going on there. You've probably seen this. Um, I did this for a Panduit presentation because uh, some of the other companies out there have different names, but I was very impressed by the marketing department at Panduit. They came up with this name for the plug, the FP6X88MTG. I mean, you can tell powerhouse these guys at Panduit are. They make great products, but I think they could come up with better names. But anyway, that's a that's a fantastic <laughs> name. That's like that's it like saying, the that's like the cable, you know, George Harold Michael Thomas the Fourth kind of thing for their plug connector. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, the Panduit guys thought that was a uh, well, pretty clever, and then they, you know, they had a security escort the in mouth. the room. But uh, <laughs> go to the next next one, and you'll see why people are doing this. Is they're putting these field terminated plugs on there so they avoid this situation. Actually, the picture at the right was taken by a, a woman I know who's a, who's a mucky muck at a cabling company. And that was at McCarran Airport in Las Vegas. And they literally had the cables out there going to the security camera and to the uh, Wi-Fi access point. And she said, you know, somebody with a stick could have reached up and just yanked those things out and disabled that camera just that easily. So the idea is instead of using the wall plate and patch panels like you would use in a typical office, you just put this plug on the end of the cable and then you really all you need is a little hole in the wall and you plug it into the back of the access point or your camera, cleaner look your and it's actually lower cost because you don't have that box that somebody has to put in you don't have these pack cables so it's it's a great idea and the next slide i'll show is i just wanted to point out so that everybody knows is there is a way to test this there's a definition now for this modular plug terminated link and if you buy a, a modern tester i won't name any brands they um <laughs> they will test this for you and they're designed because the key thing is is that they actually test the connector on the end most tests don't include that plug on the end, but this test, the modular plug terminated link does. So um, you can now test that link and a lot of run into are like, well, no, I didn't, you can't test that. It's field terminated. It's like, oh yeah, now you can. As of last summer, they defined a new, uh, a new standard around that and a number of products out there on the market support it. Not just us, but we do it the best, of course. Anyway, well, um, I'll skip ahead of some of those slides. But I do want to cover that. 
the modular field terminated, why it's important to try and explain to people is that they come with kind of this snub nose end that's not necessarily an RJ45. So why would you do it? Like, if you ask me, I'm a network guy, I'm just going to say, just put an RJ45 on the end of that cable. I can plug it into the back of the camera. Uh, the modu- oh, if I'm if I'm, yeah. if I'm understanding the modular field termination connector, the real value there is you put this connector on there that's kind of snub nose, and you can connect it either to a, uh, a keystone jack that becomes a female RJ45, or you could pull it off and flip it around and put a male RJ45 connector on the end without having to recut and re-terminate the cable. Is that the benefit that I'm understanding on that mark, or is there something different? I've- I've I have seen that kind of design. If you go back to that picture of the of the Panduit plug, I don't know if you know when, when we first started this business. We um, one of the things we'd do is we'd make our new employees. It was kind of a rite of passage. We'd make them put one of those standard RJ45 connectors on the end of a uh, you know a four pair twisted pair. Go back to the previous slide. And I don't know if you've ever done that. And I don't know how many people here in the audience have done that. Not many people do that anymore. I'll tell you, it's really hard. It can take like, for the first time you do it, it could take you 20 to 30 minutes to do it. And you'll probably end up throwing three or four of them away because you didn't quite get the wires all the way in there and get them crimped. What the wire manufacturers have done with these connectors is they've made them so they're actually easy to connect. If you've ever connected an RJ45 jack, They're designed so they're easy to do, but the plugs have always been basically just designed for high volume production, and they're not really that easy to put on. These plugs are actually easy to put on, and more importantly, they're designed so that if when you design when you put them on, you'll actually get the full Cat 6A performance out of them. So that's really what their uh, what their uh, claim to fame is. It's the ease of installation. And the fact that when you get it on, it's a really, really solid connection. And it's not just Panduit. There are other vendors as well that make these. They look a little big and clunky compared to what you see on the patch cord, but that's because they're designed to be easy to put on. All right, Mark, do you mind if I, yeah, makes sense. Do you mind if I pause? I want to let Maria bring up some of the questions our audience is Let's having. Let's do it. Live, you know, in the middle of the stream. So, Maria, what, what do you have for us? Let's go ahead and throw it up on the screen. Um, So this one I can't throw up, unfortunately. It's from a Facebook question, um, but I'm happy to um, ask it on behalf of the customer. So it's Tommy Willis. Um, He did want to know, he asks, do I understand that PoE++ means that all four pairs are used to power the item? No use of network to send info to that item on the same cable. Oh, you want to take that one or you want me to take that one? I'll take it. Um, So Tom... Okay. This is Tom Willis, right? He's yes. our good buddy, Tom. Thanks, Tom, for participating. Tom is one of our regulars, and we love him here on the show. So if I'm understanding you right, Tom, and correct me if I'm wrong, and what I'm going to do is just uh, jump over here. We'll come back to the presentation in a second. So, Tom, if I understand you right, what you're, you're asking is, if I'm doing 90 watts and I'm doing 60 watts, can I still run power? On, can I still run data up to 10 gig on that cable? Does it sound like I got that right, Maria? Yes. The answer is, and I think Mark, you can would agree with this, you can still run power and data combined. And that's a really big benefit. And you don't want to take that benefit away from power over Ethernet. In the past, we've talked about it. There are not a lot of applications out there that have required 10 gig and 90 watts of power. Uh, But as Mark had pointed out earlier, we don't want to close off that opportunity by saying, no, you don't have to do it. So yes, you can run power up to 90 watts on the same cable you run data. And as long as you're using CAT 6, you should be able to get 10 gig out of that. That's right. And in fact, I use that example of Li-Fi as something that not really a, a thing today, but it will be, it could potentially have a need for both high power and 10 gig in the same line. But even if you look at like the monitors that uh, that people are putting out there today, you know those could easily use 90 watts and would probably require at least a gig to you know put live video on a screen. We're working on that, <laughs> Mark. We got to we got to take, take introduce you to the live streaming guys and the NDI technology. That is really cool. So, Mark, uh, you and I should pull off and talk about NDI at some point. For those of you who don't know, NDI New Tech developed NDI which is a streaming protocol that lets you send 4K or 1080p, 4K or 1080p, two different standards, 
um, over a network cable with only about 30 megs. And that's a really impressive compression ratio. So you're absolutely, you're, you're right in that. New tech is, is developed this really cool technology. But yes, that's something very cool coming down the line. Anyway, okay. sorry. I don't know Any, about everything. Yeah. Uh, Maria, any other good questions we should throw up? It looks like that's all we have for now. Um, I'm, I expect some more as the PowerPoint continues, though. Okay. Well, okay, let's in dive. Fact, Go ahead, that's Mark. a great lead in to what I'm going to talk about next. Um, in fact, I'm going to skip over because we don't want to kill people with PowerPoint. So I want to go ahead to where I, we talk about um, the resistance measurements, I believe. So just keep skipping ahead. we we'll got that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Yeah. Resistance testing. So right here, this little diagram is kind of the secret sauce of how this works is basically you're sending the power by using DC power on the same pairs that you're sending the, in effect, AC signals. So I think if you click, there's some words that come up over there that'll probably remind me to say something. Yeah. So that the key thing though that makes this to, that makes this work is you have to balance the current. Now, if you think about that, PoE is what? It's uh, it's about 50 volts. And if you want to run 90 Oops. watts, I think that means you're running uh, like a half an amp over each pair. And a half an amp isn't a lot of current, but remember, these are pretty small conductors. You know, your, your stuff you use in the house, you know, your 16 and 14 gauge Romex is a lot more copper than what you've got in some of this twisted pair cabling, which is like, like a 24 gauge cabling and sometimes smaller even, 23, 24 gauge and sometimes smaller. So the key thing is you've got to balance that current across all four pairs, okay? Because if you don't, the way these things are designed, you'll end up with too much current running over some of these pairs. It's going to overheat and then it's not going to work. So the current has to be balanced across all four wires for it to work. And that requires two things. First off, the resistance of the cabling has to be low, right? I mean, obviously, if you have a lot of resistance, you remember Ohm's law, you got too much power trying to go through too much resistance. It's going to heat up. You get more resistance, the hotter it gets. You get this kind of deadly feedback loop and you're, uh, your communications is not going to happen. Your POE is not going to happen. So it needs to be low and it also needs to be balanced so that you get the same amount of power over all four pairs. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the next slide. Now, here's the interesting thing. The field test that you run, if you buy one of our testers or somebody else's testers, the field test does not require that you test these, make these measurements. Oh, wait a minute, what? Now, if you look at, because you might say, well, hey, I look at, I every day in the morning and I read TIA 568.2-D, which is the cabling standard, and I read my 802.3, and I say, you know what? Loop resistance is in there, and resistance unbalanced to make sure they're balanced, that's in there too. And you'd be right, it, it is in there. The issue is it's not in the field testing addendum, which is TIA 1152A. In TIA 1152A, they say it's optional. So what this means, and by the way, ISO handles the same thing, it handles it more or less the same way. It means that the cable manufacturer has to test for these things, but when you install it in the field, you don't have to. Well, maybe that's okay, maybe it's not. Let's go to the next slide. See, the problem is if the cable quality isn't quite as good as you think, or the workmanship whoever installs the stuff doesn't do quite enough of a job, quite a good enough job. Maybe they don't use the right tools. Maybe it's their first day on the job, who knows what. You can end up with these resistance issues which are going to play havoc with your attempts to run PoE in the future. So if you skip ahead, in fact, this, is, this may be where I, uh, yeah, this may be where I go off script here and uh, maybe I'll just uh, stop the PowerPoint here and I'll, I'll show you what I got here and I'll give you a little demonstration. I don't know if we can share this screen, but what I was gonna show you is I got this cable here that I, I went out on Amazon and bought this. Big old wad of cable right here, okay? This is good yeah. stuff. Um, it says right on it, it says it's Cat5e, so it must be good stuff, right? And so I terminated this. I, I put together 89 meters of it. And uh, I'm going to see. I might be able to. 
now we haven't set up to the screen today. So maybe I'll just skip over it, but and run rather than try and run that demonstration. But what you'll find is if I test this cable, it's going to look great. If I test it with a basic tester, not a certification tester, but you know, just your basic wire map tester and kind of that. When we sell those testers, they're great for troubleshooting. But what you're going to find is there's all kinds of resistance problems in this cabling. And that's because, well, how do I say this nicely? It's the cheapest stuff I could find on Amazon. <laughs> Now, if you go out and buy the good cable from, you know, uh, a Panduit, I, I've been picking on them a lot tonight or today, or a Belden or a Burke Tech or a Leviton. You know, if you buy those guys' products, you probably don't have to worry about this. But some of the lower cost stuff out there, they don't really do that resistance. And so you don't really know what you're getting until you get in there. And this cable, like I said, it'll run data fine. But if you try to run... POE and data on that cable at the same time, one or the other of those or both are not going to work properly. You won't get all the power you need because it'll get eaten up in the resistance of the cable. The balance will be off and that's going to cause a lot of problems in terms of trying to transmit the data as well. And of course, as we all know, networks are very um, forgiving about those kinds of problems, right? With TCP, you'll retransmit up to 16 times just to see if the data gets through. And so a lot of those problems will be covered until maybe things get a little bit worse. You try and run a little more traffic. You try and upgrade, say, from 100 meg to gig, and suddenly it just doesn't work at all. And those are the kinds of problems that we say with cable testing that you're trying to prevent, right? You don't want those yeah. problems that crop up and then take you weeks to solve somewhere down the road because somebody did something. They cut some corners, saved a little money in the short run. Well, actually, you know, Nighthawk Group uh, commented on it. Uh, did we get yes. it all up on the screen, or um, what, what else is what I can, else? Yeah, I can finish it off. It looks yeah. like it didn't all make it. So Nighthawk Group, they're coming from Elgin, Illinois. Um, they said not all It's Elgin in Elgin. Illinois. Oh, in Texas, no. by the way. So, you, so everybody knows we can solve this problem. It's Elgin in Texas with a G, but it's Elgin in Illinois. I'm so Come sorry, on. Nighthawk. <laughs> a, a Wayne's wow. World fan I didn't would know, know this. Yeah, yeah. There's, <laughs> Party it, it, time. Yeah. <laughs> Party on, Garth. <laughs> uh, so Nighthawk says, not all Cat6 is created equal. Depending on the MFG, I see Cat5e, Cat6, and 6a rated for 350 uh, millihertz. He use it, or Nighthawk uses a minimum of 550. So for purposes of your discussion, what should Cat6 or Cat6a be rated? And what gauge wire? And, and just so, for, for you know, I love our guys at Nighthawk. That is some seriously intense techie talk right there. And I'm going to try <laughs> and bit. translate. So Nighthawk, correct me if I've got this wrong. By all means, tell. So what uh, what we're talking about is megahertz. Is, so with the different cat five or different category cables, the megahertz that he's talking about is the frequency or the speed, how fast you can turn on and off the little signal, right? So with the data signal, what it is is it turns on for like a volt for a very short time and then turns it down to a negative it's about 2.5 volts. It goes up 2.5 volts, down 2.5 volts. And that's the on off signal. And when you're talking about frequency, if I did that 60 times a second, that is one Hertz. So you can imagine when he's talking 350 megahertz, that is 350,000 times. I mean, if I got my, my suffix right, or I'd be is it million. Mega? million times That's right million. right mark Mega is million. 350 million times wow. times 60 uh every second and, and wow. that tells you how fast that cable needs to be ready to take a little signal up and a little down and so um what happens is little now we're getting into like the minutia the detail of that cable you're really getting some some tiny details to make sure that that cable can do it at 550 times I'm 60 a second. So, um, and, and so, Mark, do you want to weigh in on this one about what yeah, should we gonna, say in like rating? Yeah, let me weigh in on this one a little bit. So, um, that kind of measurement, that's kind of, that's kind of half of a measurement. I'm reminded of, uh, of George Carlin used to tell a joke. He used to say, um, and here's a partial score, Houston Astros, four. Now, on to the weather. Anyway, it's, it's one of those things that, it's, it's part of the data, but it's not all of it. The biggest determinant of cable performance, I mean, resistance and some of those things are important, but the biggest resistance of cable performance or biggest indicator of cable performance is what's called crosstalk. And I have a whole lot of 
can give on all very, very brief. Some of you older people might remember, and in fact, you probably still get this sometimes too. You ever pick the phone and you can hear some other kind of conversation in the background? I don't know if that's, that doesn't happen very often anymore. Because oh, wow, Mark, people. you are, you're, you're, unfortunately, my friend, you're dating yourself just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Back when I was running the old switchboards, you know, and I was plugging people in. <laughs> anyway, but the, the, the term means, crosstalk means a conversation from one pair that gets on another pair. And what makes a good cable better than another cable is its resistance to crosstalk. Now, the higher the frequency, the more crosstalk you're going to have. And at some point, you get so much crosstalk that the, it's, it's actually starts to become almost as big as the signal that you're trying to send. And at that point, it won't work anymore, right? I mean, imagine if you're trying to send data out your Ethernet port and the crosstalk is coming back in on the receive pair at such, so strongly that it thinks it's a signal's coming in. Well, as we all know how Ethernet works, it'll stop communicating Im immediately, right? Mm -hmm. Collision detection, right? So um, you can't have that much crosstalk. So when I say a cable is rated to 350 megahertz, my big question is how much crosstalk is at 350 megahertz? I can measure it at 350, I could measure it at 550, I could measure it at 600. There is actually, and that's where kind of your testing comes in, is your tester will go out and look at the cable and say, okay, here's your crosstalk at every frequency from zero up to, depending on what the standard is, 350, 500, or even up to past a gig if you're talking about category eight, which isn't very widely used. So my question is, is if a cable says it's rated to 350 or it's rated to 550, my next question would be, well, let me see the crosstalk spec. Because if, unless I can compare that spec of how much crosstalk it has at those frequencies, just telling me that you tested at those frequencies isn't telling me the information I really need to know. That's Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, like I said, a field tester will tell you that and then tell you exactly what it does. And then there's a spec. So category 6A has a certain spec. It has a limit line. And if you look at, you, you, if I took that line and I don't know how does, how does this work, and I were to plot it, you'd see the line goes like, so you're gonna get it right way. It, it's, it's going to go less and less crosstalk. And then as you get in higher frequencies, you're allowed more crosstalk, but still you have to be below that limit. And it's around, you know, at 350 uh, megahertz, it's around 35 dB of crosstalk that's allowed, which means that the signal is, if I can remember that, it's about five to one as compared to the crosstalk. You start to get down to where the signal is two to one compared to the crosstalk, and then you have so much interference, the electronics in the Ethernet card are going to go, ah, I can't figure out what's going on here. Yeah. So sorry, that was a long explanation. That but... was a long one. Did, did, did the guys from Nighthawk get back to us? Did they correct us um, at all? They have not, they so fall hopefully asleep? we answered their question, but <laughs> I don't think they fell asleep. Um, hopefully they'll chime in if there is anything they need to add on or, you know, we didn't clarify. Fantastic. Well, Mark, how are we doing on that presentation? Are we ready to get into the troubleshooting portion of the the? Yeah, I can talk, talk a little today. bit about that. Yeah, sorry, I got that. Yeah. I got the allergies today. So it's anyway, right. you're up um, in Washington. Yeah, there's a lot of pollen today. You know. All right, so let's uh, let's throw that PowerPoint back up there and see what else we got going on here. All right, let's do that. Yeah, because we got one more thing now. What I was talking about there beforehand with the resistance measurements and the certification and all that. As much as I'd like to tell people you should go out and buy a tester and do this testing, you know, like on a weekly basis, you don't need to. You really only need to do it once when you install the cabling. And in fact, most customers don't do that. They hire a contractor who comes in and, you know, you just need to make sure that they're doing the right kind of testing. And then you're really not going to have anything to worry about. The next thing that happens, though, is when you go to install things or to troubleshoot things, you don't need anything quite that complicated. But let's zip ahead a couple of slides because I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the issues we've got is, you know, PoE confusion. Yeah, leave that. That's a perfect one. You know, and Tyler, I'm sure you've talked about this before is, you know, PoE is not a licensed term. I can put PoE on, I can put it on a popsicle. It's, you know, it, there's no rule that can only put it on certain things. There's three standards, there's eight classes and wattage levels, there's four types. You've got a lot of different kinds of names, PoE, PoE plus, and so on. You've got passive PoE. I didn't even know that existed until a couple of months ago where they just 
put some power on there. Sounds dangerous, but eh, what do I know? Uh, there's LLDP. There's actually higher level negotiated implementations of PoE. The big question is, will all that stuff interoperate? And that's why, if we go to the next slide, we've got these different classes and power levels. And what's happened is, and what's in process is the next slide, is the um, Ethernet Alliance is putting together this PoE certification program. Now it's just getting off the ground. So I wouldn't expect to find lots of products out there yet, but it is something I would keep my eye on because their idea is, is to rate every, take every product into a lab, test it with a wide variety of other equipment and test equipment and verify that it will interoperate with other EA certified products and what its power level is. And the power level is defined by the eight classes I showed earlier. So on power sourcing equipment, that's the one with the arrow coming out of it on the, on the left, and powered devices with the arrow going into it, each one would show what it's capable of doing and what it needs to operate. So in this case, I'm showing, for example, this a switch with a three on it means that it's a class three switch and the powered device is a one. If I plug these two devices together, I should have no problem with them working. And the Ethernet Alliance will have verified that this stuff works. So this is an interesting program, and I, I think it could end up clearing up a lot of confusion for people and saving them a lot of time and trouble by just looking for Ethernet Alliance certified products. Now, most of the products that are being certified today are more of your uh, component levels, you know, your, uh, your ICs and, and board level things and stuff like that. But you will start seeing over the next few months some of the bigger manufacturers starting to uh, starting to push this. So that's a, I think that's an exciting development that's going to make things a lot easier. I don't know, uh, Tyler, how much you guys are involved in this, but it, it, I think it could be a very helpful thing. Yeah, we want to get involved. We want our goal is to make um, power over Ethernet easier. So um, yeah. for our customers to use. So, you know, I'd love to get into some of these practical ones, Mark. I mean, uh, let's uh, swap over here. Um, get the screen changed over. Come on. There you go. So, Mark, one of the things that we could do is we could throw up on our screen, the uh, throw up a, an actual practical case where you talked about the confusion and the different types. So, uh, for example, I'm going to, if it's all right, I'm going to swap, move our camera around, and I apologize for the motion here, everybody. Uh, but we're gonna zoom in here for those purposes, Mark. I brought in a couple of, uh, I set up a couple of demos. Is that a of different PoE products. camera? This is a PoE camera. Um, I got an Amcrest here, uh, and it's an Amcrest dome camera. And I wanted to show a couple of different features here that customers may wanna know about. Um, so I've got a, this guy, it is important to know what they're, they're um, you know, a lot of people have what we call mode confusion. So we're going to, I'm going to show you how to troubleshoot for mode confusion. And if, if you're not familiar with mode, Maria is going to paste in the chat lines a link to what is mode A or what is mode B. Basically what it means is mode talks about which wires inside the ethernet cable the power runs on. Now earlier you had said, or pair PoE, and, and, and not everyone may know that typical PoE, your average PoE, will very often only run on four of the eight pairs. And it depends on what four it runs on. And I'll give you a great example here. So I'm gonna pan this guy down just a little bit so you can see these two. These are both mid-spans here. And what they're designed to do, this. This one on the left is, is a 802.3 AT or PoE plus midspan. And what it will do is it will power up the mode A wires, which are pins one, two, three, and six. And if I throw my little detector here on there just to see it, so this is our little PoE detector. What you'll see is my little light here will start flashing on the mode A side. And so that tells me that I've got power on pins one, two, three, and six. But this guy over here is specially designed to work with devices rated for mode B power. And uh, some of those, and I'll move my mic here out of the way, sorry, most some of those include 
ubiquity and other type of devices. And if I plug in my power here, my little light changes position, that tells me it's mode B. And what that is, that means the power is running on pins four, five, seven, and eight. So you're not getting power on all four pairs with all PoE. Now, if you, if you opt for a larger device that does four pair PoE, like our managed mid-span, and I'll pan down just a little bit here so you can see it. This is our managed mid-span. It will do four pair PoE on, and that does power on one, two, three, six, four, five, seven, and eight. And you can see the light flashing here for both mode A and mode B. Now, why is that important? Why do I even care about this, right? Mark, you're talking about that uh, Ethernet Alliance, and they will deal with some of these questions. A good PoE device, uh, a, a quality power over Ethernet splitter, like a uh, like we do at PoE Texas, I'll shamelessly throw that <laughs> plug out there. Um, a good PoE splitter should be able to take power on either mode A or mode B, but that's not always true of every device. Some devices only want power on mode A. Some devices only want power on mode B. And some devices actually do a weird combination of both, including these ubiquity, um, these ubiquity Wi-Fi access points. And I'm going to pan back up there real quick. This uh, Wi-Fi access point is designed to. Some of them now are coming out designed to work on mode B power at 24 volt passive. That was that standard you talked about. We could talk a little bit about uh, those t different standards, Mark, but. They are designed to work on mode B power. So if I go ahead and plug our, uh, our cable here into our mid-span, you'll get to see that bad boy should light up here in just a second. Power. Ah, it's probably because I don't have the right power on there. And we need to check what our power is. But it's designed to work on 24 volt passive mode B and 802.3A. F or regular PoE on the mode A wires. So you can see we got a little troubleshooting problem here. What is this guy doing? So if I plug in here, I can see that my green solid shows that I should be running 24 volt passive. I should be able to power up this uh, this Wi-Fi access point. Now probably my problem is I don't have data, but I'll cover that in another troubleshooting. But I wanted to cover that mode A B confusion because I think. Um, it happens occasionally, and you'll find it. What ends up happening is, is you plug in your device, and it just doesn't power on, just like you saw. And uh, that would be a, a first port of call I would go to to deal with the mode A, B confusion. And I did have a question for you, Mark, on that note. Um, I think we were yeah. supposed, we were going to show a video of one of your testers um, kind of in the field, how it works. Oh, yeah. So a few weeks ago, we did a show on 24-volt passive PoE was kind of you know the whole show surrounding that so do any of your troubleshooting tools work with that voltage or they are are they all af at bc no they will identify passive poe on there as well as well as show you the pairs as well so yeah this new tester that we just came out with last month will do that yeah wonderful and that's you. really an important troubleshooting thing to be able to see what pairs your power is running mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there are so many different ways that this has been implemented, which is, I think is good. I think it's good that people try a lot of different things, but it's also it's a little bit of a minefield for customers, right? Yes, it is. And that's why getting some expertise and some knowledge with your POE is so important. Right, right. It, and having some tools good... like your tester there, or our tester, mm -hmm. any tester, yeah. I think is, is really handy to have. So you know, important. as I mentioned, if you get the cable certified ahead of time, then, okay, now I can move that out. I don't have to worry about that anymore. But then when I'm doing installation and troubleshooting, it's good to have some sort of a basic tool around to help me solve those kinds of problems. Otherwise, well, uh, you know, we have a video that shows, you know, a different video than the one. Well, no, I think it is maybe the one you're going to show that can show, you know, that you can spend a lot of time chasing down all kinds of problems because you don't really know. Is it the cable? Is it the port? Is the port configured right? Maybe the device is broken. You can spend a lot of time trying to, you know, 
replace things and hope maybe that fixes it when that's really not very effective. Yes, and so often um, the the problem that I've always run into with these types of situations is um, nobody wants to take responsibility for it. <laughs> like, um, you know, I get those situations where you call up the, the guy who does the Wi-Fi access point or the guy who's doing the whatever device you have and you, you point out, I plugged it in, it's turned on, I, everything should be running. And they say, well, I'll call up the switch guy because the switch guy, it's his problem. It's not my problem anymore. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you, you call the switch guy and he says, no, 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 no. It's the, it's the camera guy. The reality is, is for, for good users um, and for educated users, you have to be able to do a little bit of troubleshooting on your mm -hmm. own. You can't, uh, mm -hmm. as much as we'd love to make it so easy that you can just call one guy or the other. Um, now, having said that, you know, I'll, pull, I'll throw it out there. Maria mans our phone lines with Erica. If you call Pewee, Texas, you're going to get somebody who will help walk you through it. But even then, you know, as Mark pointed out, having the right tools there on the ground with you at the time you're dealing with the problem makes all the difference in the world. I can't tell you how often... You know, Maria will look at, uh, ask somebody on the phone, well, can you throw a tester on it and tell me what it says? And the, and the answer is, I don't have anything to they test. They don't have one, yeah. And, you know, uh, yeah. the reality is, for the price, yeah, you know, it, it, you had said, Mark, you could spend an hour. How much is your, how much is your time worth? If, you got, if it takes you two or three hours to deal with a problem, is it worth um, the, the, the less than $100 for our tester? Mark, I think you guys are retailing it at what? It, like seven hundred dollars. This one's about seven hundred, yeah, because it, it yeah. has a lot of different features, a lot of different test capabilities built into one box. Oh yeah, yeah. and it you does. know it's 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 interesting. You know, you mentioned. I'm glad to hear that you guys. You know, you have people that answer the phone. We do too. You can actually talk to people at our company. But you know, everything is so specialized nowadays. I am sure your technical support people know more about the intricacies and details of POE than our people do. But I am sure that ours know more about the intricacies and the details of the king than your team does. And it's, it's very hard to find one person that's a super expert. But if you do have some sort of a tester, that can really help you figure out who you should call. Okay, this is yes. a cable problem. I need to call a cable guy. Or this is a POE okay. problem. I need to call a POE guy. Exactly. You know, it, it really yes. helps. Oh, yeah. Totally agree. So, Maria, any, I want to check in before we, we move on and we do another troubleshooting. Um, any, any other feedback somebody would like to, we can talk about? Um, it doesn't look like we have no new questions. Nighthawk did say that their question was answered, so it looks like they did get all of the info they Good. needed. Uh, but no new questions right now. Okay. Well, great. Well, Mark, I'm going to talk about, um, if, if we could, for troubleshooting, one that we see very often. Maria, you can tell me if you see this. Polarity. Do you see any? Do you, do you find people are having polarity problems now? Yeah, it's pretty common. It's common enough to where we can talk about it. I wouldn't yeah. say it's you know every phone call that we get, <laughs> but there's definitely customers who need it. So so we'll talk about polarity. Polarity is that uh, is similar or in the same vein as the mode A B confusion, uh, because when you're sending the power over the network cable one of the pairs has to be positive. And Mark, you were talking about with the resistance, the balance of the resistance, one pair has to be positive and one pair has to be negative. Again, a lot of devices at the power device end will actually have a diode bridge and that diode bridge allows them to take power either on, like it allows you to basically flip the plus and the minus back and forth. But that's not always the case. And there are also a couple of specialty devices that require very special polarity. Um, we ran into this problem um, with a Ubiquiti Air Fiber. It was a mm -hmm. very interesting polarity. This is a very interesting use case, Mark. And I, I think um, the audience might be interested in it. So let me flip this up again so that we can take a look at it live. So. Uh, let's let's assume this is a ubiquity air fiber up here, and this was an interesting use case. Um, this is not an air fiber, by the way. This is just a Wi-Fi access point. I think it's a UAP AC light, if I remember right. Apologize, right off the top of my head, I don't remember. But the uh, the air fiber had an interesting problem. The my customers would call us up and say, "We're trying to power this guy," and it uh, it doesn't. It powers up well, but then 
as we run it, it gets unstable and it would drop out no notice. And it was always ironically at the worst time. And what happened with that one is that the, uh, what was happening is, is the, the air fibers are four pair passive PoE, like you talked about, Mark, and they take the, the 48 to 56 volt. Works great. The problem that the customer was having is Ubiquity had reversed the polarity on the mode A wires, then our polarity power was running. And so what would you would end up having happen was is it would power up to 30 watts of power and work just fine on 30 watts of power. And so it gave every indication that it was working well. But when the demand on the device creeped up just above 30 watts, because the polarity on the mode A wires was reversed, it would cap out on 30 watts with our mid spans and then drop out above 30 watts uh, because it, it wasn't getting that extra power. And so what we ended up finding out was you just had to do a crossover cable for the mode A wires. And what that meant is hmm. you simply flip the, what, what were powering pins one, two, and three and six, we just swap them. And that happens pretty often. And what you're looking for with that is if you're doing a, uh, if you're doing a tester, and I'm assuming your tester does polarity reversal, right, Mark? It'll indicate what yes, polarity it, it you're working Yes, it will show at. you that. Yep. And, and, and what you're looking for, for example, is if you've got a reverse polarity um, on one of our detectors or testers, it, it'll turn up a red solid color, gives you reverse polarity. Otherwise, um, it, you could see it on our, one of our testers. When you plug in the tester, it will give you the, uh, there we go, getting power. It'll give you an indication what polarity you're working on. Oops, sorry, showing myself what <laughs> polarity you're working on. And that polarity is important because not all devices will operate with both polarities. So that's a tr that's a, mm -hmm. the other trouble. Another troubleshooting tip that I'd give is if you're looking at a device that's unstable or it won't power up, uh, give it that mode A B check really quickly. Very easy check and fast to do when you've got the right tools. And then the next thing that I would suggest is double check your polarity. And usually it's called out on the data sheet, uh, the polarity of both your powering device, the PSE and the PD. That's a very, uh, and that we see that a lot. Mm -hmm. hmm. So that's, that's my explanation on polarity. Mark, do you have a troubleshooting tip that you, you think we should be discussing um, or outlining to our, our clients or our audience today? Well, um, what would my troubleshooting tip be in terms of POE? Uh, you know, the one thing I guess I come to is that a very large percentage of network problems are, result, you know, are a result of cabling problems. So making sure that your cabling is certified when it's put in is very valuable. And then having some basic cable testing tools when it's time to troubleshoot is very handy as well. Because one of the things you're able to do is to... A, determine that the cabling is not the problem. And then B, if it is the problem, figure out exactly what's wrong with it. Like you said, maybe you've got a pair swapped. Maybe there's an open pair somewhere in the cable. And if you know where it is, you can go and fix it very, very quickly. So I guess as a cabling guy, of course, I'm going to say, check out the cabling, make sure it's good. And then you can go worry about some of these more esoteric problems. But most of the time, you know, somebody yanked the cable out of the wall and then kind of tucked it back in there so that nobody would notice and it, should, it looks good it's fine and that's the kind of thing you can find with a cable tester well how would it, this is an interesting one this was going to be one that i would bring up how can you identify and you were talking about this earlier about derating a cable what's the best way for determining whether a cable run is too long you've just you're, you're 330 feet or you're 325 feet and, you know, some of the symptoms I would be looking for in that situation is that it works most of the time. As you pointed out, devices will work well at lower data rates until, um, until you get to the higher data rates, then that crosstalk and miscommunication happens. So, Mark, is there a way to really quickly test for that? Well, 
I'll, I'll say that the symptoms I think you pointed out are very good. Um, a lot of retransmits and dropped packets, that could be a thing. Problems when you try and go to a higher speed. And one of the things you'll find, a lot of this equipment will shift. You know, if you try to have it, say, 100 meg, and it's just not working, it will then try, it will try and switch back to lower speeds. Some of the newer switches and whatnot will do that automatically. If you can't consistently keep the higher speed, that's an indication. And then intermittent problems, which are the worst. Those are the other four look for as well. Um, obviously, testing the length is very, very easy. I mean, I can get a tester and tell you the, the length of the cable in about three seconds, and you can pretty you can figure out if it's too long. If it comes out and says it's uh, you know 393 feet, yeah, you, you're probably trying to get away with something that is going to work. Although I, you know, I point out there is a cabling company. I don't remember their name. They make a uh, they make a cable called the Game Changer, and uh, I can't remember their name. But just a Game Changer cabling, I'm sure you can find out about it. Their cable is specially designed to be able to longer runs, including for me. And you know, one of the things that they talk about is in terms of let's say I need to install a camera, and it's 500 feet from the wiring closet. Page is the name of the company, by the way, P-A-I-G-E. They run the cable 550 feet, and it will work. Now, I don't know if it's a your gauge or, or whatever they do to make it work, but we've actually now got test limits in our product built in. Now, is that legal as far as Category 6A? No. But if you think about the alternatives, you know, one of the things I talk about is trying to avoid doing things that plant a landmine. A lot of times what people will do is they'll install a repeater, right? So I run 300 feet, I install a repeater, then I get another 200 after that. That's perfectly legal, but then everybody forgets there's a repeater there, right? And then someday in the mm -hmm. future, someday that repeater out, nobody knows it's there, they don't know why it's not working, they go to the end of the cable, it's dead, they go to the beginning of the cable, it's live, they're gonna see something weird because it's gonna say the cable's 200 feet long from one end, and 300 feet long from the other end, and it's and then you're going to spend a lot of time digging around. Actually, even though this is not quite standard, there is some advantage in having, say, just one 500 foot run that goes out to your camera, and you know it's, it's easy to troubleshoot. It's a, a point of failure has been removed because now you don't have the repeater that can die, and you have something that's a little bit easier to troubleshoot. So, you know, we talk about the long cables. There are some answers to that that are out there in industry that I think are, are certainly worth looking at. Definitely, definitely. And and for those of you who are curious, um, at PUE Texas, we do have the repeaters. Um, and Maria, will you throw that link into the yes, chat I line? Will. We have a whole blog Sorry, about not trying to repeaters. Take no, 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 no. Hey, you know what? Uh, this is great. You, you, we want the audience to be able to get the broadest range of input and feedback, and and there is no agenda here. Um, get the best information, right. and I and we want everybody to be able to make the right call. And and you're right. Sometimes a an extra long run with the page equipment is the best choice. Sometimes it's a repeater, and it depends on the application. Right. And having the education, having the knowledge of what your options are, makes it so that you can make the call you can decide rather than having somebody decide for you as you're pointing out mark that's the key part and i have a question for you mark um uh, i think it was regarding the micro scanner test that you guys have available if i saw it correctly is that powered with two double a batteries yes okay and so is that does that is that helpful for if you're testing say just the ethernet cable with no power on the line that way you can still get that reading Right, right. In fact, see, okay. the, the tester does not require that the PoE be live when I plug it in. Because let's face it, let's say um, the number one thing, I'll talk about crosstalk and resistance and all that. I don't know if you know what the number one cabling problem is, but it's that the cable goes to the wrong place. So, <laughs> you know, you go out there, you plug in the camera, and nothing happens. You test run, and you see it's a 200 foot run, you expect. But then you go back to the office and you water closet and you vote on the end and it can't find the remote and suddenly you realize this cable is labeled wrong, right? As it goes to here, 
but it's not. Now I've got to go through and I've got to find out which one of these cables. So we also have a toner built into it. So you all of this with OPOE on the cable. So yeah, the, the tester itself has to have power. Um, rechargeables are nice, but one of the things we found is for a product is used more intermittently as a troubleshooting product. Regular AA batteries, they keep a charge longer. And if it's, you know, if the batteries have died, I can just slap some new ones in it and I'm good to go. I don't have to plug it in and wait, you know, half an hour for it to charge up before I can do any work. Right. Well, if you're going to ask me, Maria, sorry, and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to budge right in here. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I prefer no battery. So and that's, uh, that's, that's one of the features. Oh, sure. That, that's one of the features. We do actually choose to run over PoE. Let me see if I can pull this guy around enough uh, so that the devices are PoE powered. Um, and I'll explain why, uh, because I don't know about, you know, unless you're using a tool every day, what I find inevitably happens is I put it in my toolbox and six to eight months later, I come out, I pull it out of my toolbox and the damn batteries are dead. Sorry, I mean, this is a kid's show. It's a family, 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 family show. friendly show. Sorry. The batteries are dead, and I'm swearing, and I'm, yeah, I am have to go around, and I have to go find some batteries to fix it. So I go put new batteries in. I use it for that 10 minutes that I needed it. Great. Put it back in my toolbox, and sure enough, eight months later, I'm in the same boat. So I, that's, this is a personal prejudice on my part, but that, and that's definitely not standard. But I, I'll, I'll throw that out there. Um, keep in mind, batteries do depends require what you're trying changing. To do. Yeah. Yeah. It depends what you're trying to do. Um, if you look at, you know, if you're troubleshoot POE, then running off the POE makes a lot of sense. But if you're trying to troubleshoot a dead cable, you can't count. You know that there's no POE because the cable's dead. Now I got to troubleshoot this cable. So it just depends what you're trying to do. I, if I was, I think we both made the right choice, frankly. Yes. For the, the right choice for made. the right application. Yeah, right, Maria, what do you have for us? Um, it looks like Tech in the City did have to sign off. They were watching, though. Um, they did say it was a great show. They, they'll ch catch the recording of, you know, what they didn't get to, to catch here. And then just <laughs> looks like Tom wanted to know. Um, he said that he was a little worried about your location, Mark, because he sees a lot of people going in, but not a lot of people coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess some people uh, got to work a little late today. It's uh, yeah. we have some fantastic. It's like you have a not so great one there. Uh, it's we been did just pretty get, much. Oh, sorry. It's well, I'm gonna say it's been 70 degrees every day for the week and a half. This is not normal. They wow, and the sun the is out. Guys. Oh yeah. We did just get a new question from Nighthawk. Um, they said, Ooh, "That's a good no question." Yeah, speaking of no batteries and not um, and tools not on the market, is there a work light that can be powered off of a POE switch for those closets with bad lighting? Ooh, I do happen to know of an uh, an option here, and uh, they happen to be here in Austin, Texas. You can find their products on Amazon. It's called ATX LED, um, and they've got a it's a nice, nice little POE powered work light. You can set it up with motion detection. So that you wow. just plug it in, turns on. It's really it's a really simple, intuitive configuration to do. So ATX LED has those, and um, yeah, you can find them on Amazon. What do you think, Mark? What do you where would you look for something like that? I I, uh, I, I love that idea. That I got I got to check that out. You know, I have to. I'll tell a little story. My product years ago. It was called a PV detector. And actually, it was made it, it had a couple of LEDs in it. And it did what one of your products does. It told you which air power was on. Now, it only worked with, uh, you know, the base, uh, what is it, AF or H uh, POE. But, um, but one of the things that was funny is that there was a little design error made. And the LEDs they used in the product were actually like flashlight LEDs, not just indicator LEDs. So you would plug the thing in and it would it would almost blind you and be like, <laughs> oh my gosh, turn this thing off. But at least you'd know. Um, but I don't know, that was kind of a funny uh, little product. So you could have used worth that as a work lock. We don't, we don't make that anymore. <laughs> We've got some more sophisticated testers. But we've made, uh, we've made, we've actually installed LEDs on them to help you work in dark closets 
Uh, we've got uh, basically their fiber inspection scopes and they've got cameras so that a lot of times, especially in data centers, they turn all the lights off to save energy, right? Energy is a huge data centers. And so we've installed little flashlights on the end of these. They're not PoE powered, but I get the idea. It's actually a pretty good idea. It's a great yeah. product. You're going to have to send me a link on that. Okay. We will add a link to these ATX LED lights from Amazon um, to the chat. So if you're looking, look on Facebook, look on YouTube, you'll find that link. That's yes. a great question, guys. Uh, guys over at Nighthawk, appreciate that. That was a great question. What else do we have? It looks like that was it for the qu Oh, we have another one from Tom actually, Tom Willis on Facebook. Um, he said he's interested in a POE powered monitor um, so he can mm -hmm. see a lot of uses for that in a church. Is there anything you guys would like to elaborate on regarding POE monitors? The uh, simple answer is uh, I'm, I have a project on the to-do list. It's been <laughs> sitting there. I'm looking like it's right over there. I'm looking at it today. Um, a POE monitor is actually a very simple project to do. Um, what you want to do with that, Tom, and, and this is a great question, is we have our 19-volt POE plus splitter. So what this device does is it takes the POE in and it, Pulls off the power and data, and it'll do 19 volts to it, it is 19 volts DC. So as long as you have a DC 19 volt monitor, you just plug the DC cable into the back, powers up. I've used it with the monitor we were using here in front of us. I got another Dell uh, monitor. It works great. Typically up to about 22 inches. Um, once you go above 22 inches, uh, you probably need to start looking at more of that 60, 90 watts. Now, if you're interested in that level of, uh, of type of thing, we actually do work with a company called Thin Labs, and uh, we can resell their products. And those Thin Lab products are all-in-one computers and televisions, and we're going for 43 inches. And I'm we're hoping to get up to that 46-inch display, which is a pretty good display, all on 90-watt PoE. Now, um, the next question is: You got that monitor? How do you display something on that monitor? Um, two options I propose. You could get, and um, just looking to see I have one, You there are um, extenders, HDMI extenders that'll run on category cable. And that's very cool. What you would do is you could combine the power and the data of that HDMI cable onto one network cable. That's where a good mid-span will work really well for you because it'll add power to that non tcp ip data stream send that over the network cable take it off at the other end and you can use that to power your monitor and do data very cool uh, it's a very cool feature that you could do um, to do power and data and um, or you could even add a low cost um, media player at the other end and do it through a media player and with media players, you can actually send data. You can put a little USB stick on the back, all of that through network cable. So that's a great question, Tom. It is a project I commit to you, my friend. I will finish the project. It's sitting there. I've got the, I've got the blog all written up. I just need to video it and uh, get that out there. So thank you very much. And then we It'll be interesting to see if some major manufacturer, you know, like a Vizio or a Samsung, adds that to a consumer grade monitor. Um, but I, I, I would expect that PoE ethernet powered one, because that simplifies a lot of the installation too. If you're installing a home theater or you're installing in offices, you know, all our offices now have these monitors in them for sharing and meetings and all that. And it would seem like if those ran off PoE, that could be a, a real savings for installers. Well, Mark, we may not be the major manufacturer that you're thinking about, but we do have that. And, and yeah, that's, yeah. No, I mean, you can get it. it now, but I think it's going to be a very interesting thing if to see if, you know, when, when and if those guys jump on the bandwagon, because then we'll know it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing in the market if, if we start seeing that happening. Right now, it's a little bit more of a specialty thing, but I wonder if it's going to happen. That it becomes a mass think, market kind of thing where people are hooking up their homes using internet tools. Oh yeah. Well, I think I think where you're going to see this more, Mark, is in hotels and bars and locations mm. that have a lot of televisions. And yeah. um, 
you know, you, you, a senior care facility where you've got 50 rooms and usually they're mounted up on the ceiling. You can't just plug it into the normal outlet that you would plug in your normal TV. And I think that's where you're going to see it take off. The, 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 the tipping point, though, Mark, is re I think really going to be having the power at the sourcing side, affordable power. And we're just getting into yeah. the 802.3 BT world. Um, and and I'll point this out. That's also why we're doing our managed mid-span um, alternative, because it would mean you could come back and retrofit a normal network with your switch and all your hardware. You could just upgrade it to have 80 watts of power per port. And I think that's going to be, it'll be that the, the devices will come. I guess it'll be both, right? It'll be... People will demand devices that require the power, get the power, and then get the device. Did we lose you, Mark? I think we, we might, have might have lost Mark. He's, he's frozen there in a very contemplative. <laughs> he's taking, he's soaking it all in. Yeah, he's getting it all. Um, we did have a hello from Chris. I don't want to mispronounce your last name. I apologize. On Facebook, Chris Z. Said hello to Tyler. Hey, Chris, how you doing, man? <laughs> and then he also said, for corporate, that would be good, I believe, on your POE monitor, POE TV. Mm -hmm. um, but on residential side, it may be a little bit more challenging. That's a good point. Um, I, I do see that with with residential. You know, uh, the, there is a challenge with POE and residential right now where it's hard to retrofit. And um, hopefully, we, we want to start seeing a future where the POE is in the walls and it's already existing for you. Um, but yes. Retrofitting PoE, I, I can see that as a challenge. It's a lot easier when you've got plenum ceilings. You could just lift ceiling tiles and run cables. Uh, yeah, one thing Chris also mentioned on that note is that he could see it being implemented in convention workflows. Convention workflows. Um, so you're thinking like convention displays, like something at the the convention center. Eh, that is a great idea. Um, thank you for sharing that, Chris. Uh, I like that. I'm yeah, gonna think, steal it. Yeah. I <laughs> I think some I've I've come across have you know used tablets for that in different convention centers or mm -hmm. stadiums. So, yes, so larger it, screens would be interesting to see. Yeah, you know you have to have that right display. Mm -hmm. um, that display is really important, so that you, it's the size, right? You have to have the right size to fit the application, and that's that's really important. I'm sorry I couldn't throw those questions up, guys. They were on Facebook. We're, we're still working kind of working on, that I'm out. So close, Facebook. Uh, <laughs> but I'm got, happy to ask on behalf of yes, you guys. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> so I wanted to cover um, one last troubleshooting tip, and then we could wrap it up. You, you, you are a great audience. I love doing our live streams with you and Maria. I learn so much. Um, they're a lot of fun. The last thing I, I, I talked to you about is what it looks like when you overpower a PoE port on your network switch or your mid-span. So let me flip over to that other view sorry i gotta hit the uh etz let me do the let me get this over here so i'm going to be talking about what it looks like to overrun your poe port and it, it happens most of the time when you have a device on there that's drawing too much that may not be a standard poe so you're not going to see this problem typically with your uh, PUE camera, your PUE phone. They're designed for that power rating. Where you're gonna see this is if you're using a PUE Texas splitter, and let me grab one here. Uh, for example, a, a common one that we see is our PUE to USB type C device uh, that takes power over ethernet and converts it to USB-C. Where we see the problem with this is you connect it to a USB-C drawing device and a lot of USB-C drawing devices will draw 40, 50 watts of power. And the, the splitters that we have, they can take, they can provide that much power and they work well with that power. Unfortunately, what happens is the PoE port itself stops negotiating. So if I have, um, if I have a PoE port here, for example, and I actually have a practical application here on the test stand that I was playing with, I'm going to pan down just a little bit um, and apologize for the uh, speaker or the microphone in the way. Um, what I was doing is I was playing with an Intel Nook. So I got this Intel Nook here 
and I had connected it to uh, our 19 volt splitter that I was telling you about, Tom, and it converts PoE to 19 volts, which is what a NUC really wants. Uh, a NUC is basically a microcomputer produced by Intel. And when I was running it, it would run up just fine and it would work beautifully until it hit, the, it, it hit a disk read. And when it hit a disk read, it would trip the port and the, the computer would reboot suddenly. And it did it two or three times on me before I figured out what was going on. Fortunately, I was able to go in and, and I have two suggestions on that. Suggestion number one, I went into the Nook and changed the power settings to the energy efficient mode. And that energy efficient mode dropped the power consumption down low enough that our PoE switch, um, which we, we have this PoE switch will overrun up to 48 watts. So it does PoE plus, but it'll overrun up to 48 watts and it works really well. So now I've got this Nook running in battery saving mode up to 48 watts and it's driving my PoE lighting test stand that we have here. And uh, it works really well. So what you're looking for is if, and, and we talked about this with the um, kind of that overpowering problem with the air fibers, it'll happen when, uh, it'll happen intermittently at the highest demand point is really what you're looking for. And it's at that point that it'll shut off, shut, shut off suddenly, then it'll restart itself automatically. So if you're seeing kind of a, not an, in, it, it would be hard to, you know, it might be a little bit difficult to tell the difference between intermittent data failure and intermittent power failure. Um, but those are, are some easy ones to check. That's where a PoE detector, uh, sorry, PoE tester like this one, or um, fortunately the mids, I, I could see this because our mid span, our PoE switch here and our new managed mid span, they all measure the power over ethernet and tell you what your power consumption is. So I could watch that power consumption climb up peak over the, the load that I knew it would work at and then it would drop off. And I knew it wasn't a data issue or it wasn't the, the processor. So that's an interesting one that we see. Again, I see it a lot with our splitters when we're connecting to non-PoE devices. All right. So um, any last questions or Maria? And you could ask questions of me too, even though uh, we've <laughs> lost Mark. Or Mark, it looks like you're back. Let me bring you back in again. I'm back. You're back. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. It was a bit of a battle, but uh, just glad to be back. Well, we're glad to have you back. We were going to feel terrible if we missed you. I had to sign off without you. <laughs> um, I'm about to throw up some final links for every for the audience today about the new Fluke network tools as well as the white paper. Is there anything you wanted to touch base on that as I throw them up? I think just put them up there and let, let people uh, go. And it looks like you've got a great material, too, that I, uh, I might have to go off and uh, read myself. Well, everyone, um, you know, I have learned so much having Mark here. And uh, I am going to throw up Mark's contact information here so that you, uh, if you're interested in reaching out to Mark and getting to answer questions, I personally learned so much from Mark every time we talk. We run across each other at trade shows. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for reaching out to me and asking if we could do this show together. It's been a pleasure. Well, and I appreciate the opportunity. It's uh, it's really great to get out in front of customers that, uh, and help them solve problems. Yes, we have, we have a great audience. Um, we love our audience. So, um, Mark, let me thank you again. Um, I think we froze again, but thank you so much for coming on our show today, introducing us to Fluke's tools, uh, giving a, a lot of education. I learned a lot. So thank you so, so much for coming. And you are always welcome to visit us here in Austin, Texas, when the weather turns ugly in Washington. <laughs> All right. So um, thank you, Mark. We, again, um, we thank Mark for coming and we're going to just wrap up the show. So thank you everyone for coming. It, it, as always, it, please give me a little bit of time. I'm going to take our conversation today with Mark. I'm going to clean it up, cut it up into director's cuts, and you'll find those on Facebook and YouTube. Pick your channel. We'll be there and uh, get the get that little bit of detail you wanted it from the show as uh, so you don't have to go back and watch the entire hour and a half. But uh, 
really and truly you are a great audience we we oh. learn so much from you um i benefit from from your input and feedback and i know maria you talk to me always about how wonderful it is that we have such an engaged audience so give me a thumbs up give me a thumbs down either way give us feedback let us know what you want to see what, what's important to you and what you want to hear we will keep delivering the best content we can do we can deliver you so like us subscribe to us join our channel in the future yeah and as tyler mentioned myself along with erica we're the ones on the phone so if you want to call us instead feel free to give me a call we can talk about the show we can talk about any ideas we're happy to take those calls all right well thank you everybody we wish you a wonderful week and join us in, join us may 28th so uh we're going to be taking a little short break we're not going to be on the 21st we're going to be on the 28th this month where we're bringing in bob allen bob and mark actually did a, their presentation together at Bixie. Bob Allen from Siemens is coming on to talk to us about smart buildings. And Bob is a whiz at smart buildings. So if you want to know, you know, we had that great conversation with Dwight from Igor. If you want to know more about intelligent buildings, what's going on in the world of intelligent buildings, what is becoming a part of the Power Over Ethernet network, join us May 28th, 11 a.m. Central, here on your favorite channel. And uh, you guys have a great week. Wrong one. <laughs> I got us on the wrong one. Great show today, Maria. Great show, Mark. Um, it was fantastic having the show today. I really it enjoyed it. We have a great audience.